I'm a philosopher. Uh, my background's in the sciences, and I got into understanding consciousness through seeing it as a scientific problem. How can we fit consciousness into the universe as we understand it scientifically? But it's turned out that some of the questions here run pretty deep, and they're hard to, it's hard to get at them directly simply by performing experiments. So the direction I've ended up going in is relatively theoretical and foundational, asking sort of the big questions like, can consciousness be explained in terms of the brain? And what is the relationship between consciousness and the physical universe? What would you say are the top contenders right now coming from, this, from the scientific world? I mean, what, what, what looks, if there was to be an explanation, what's our, our best bet right now? You know, to be honest, I think right now we're pretty well in the dark. Are we? There's no, there's not even the leading contender right now. There's a science, a really interesting developing science, which is a science of correlations. Correlations. This brain process goes with this state of consciousness. This area of the brain goes with this kind of consciousness. And that part of the science is just getting off the ground. That's really happened in the last 10 years or so. But uh, in moving beyond correlation to an explanation and a theory, everybody has their own theory. There's no theory that commands anything even close to consensus support. What do you think about the uh, physics of consciousness, quantum physics? What's your sort of general well, take on that? It's possible there's a connection there. You know, consciousness is a very strange and mysterious subject, and it's natural to think it might take something very strange and mysterious to explain it. Quantum mechanics is certainly strange and mysterious. So uh, putting those things together, then maybe it's natural to look in that direction. On the other hand, I think that many of the... S Why do people get interested in quantum mechanics and consciousness? Partly because it looks like classical processes don't explain consciousness. Why would a whole bunch of, why would a billion interacting neurons in an area of the brain, um, no matter how complex their interactions, why would that give rise to the subjective experience of a mind? Hard to see how that could possibly happen. But now, it seems to me you can raise exactly the same question about a quantum explanation. You've got quantum wave functions uh, collapsing in microtubules over complex uh, scales of time, from superpositions to coherence to decoherence. Why does all that give you consciousness? Exactly the same gap, I think, arises in the explanation. That's the expl explanatory gap that everyone Exactly, thinks, yeah. It, it's just as, just as wide, it seems to me, in the classical case and the quantum case. They're both sort of mechanistic views, regardless. I mean, quantum mechanics, by definition. It's a new and interesting mechanism. Quantum mechanics might be able to give all kinds of useful things in, for example, the mechanistic explanation of behavior. Mm -hmm. There's a random element might help in, say, understanding decision-making. There's an element where one is led from superposed states to concrete state that might tell something about um, certain kinds of determinism of control processes. There's a certain kind of parallelism which is interesting and so on. But all that is still it's a complex, novel mechanism for the explanation of behavior. The gap to consciousness is as wide as ever. I find it useful to distinguish different kinds of problems when it comes to consciousness. The okay. easy problems are those of explaining how it is that we react, how it is that we behave, how it is that we use words, control our behavior, and get around the world. There, it seems to me that classical processes are doing pretty well. Uh, neural interactions, um, neural computations, developing in the cognitive neuroscience of the last decade, are really moving things forward. And it could turn out that quantum mechanics has a role to play there, although I think that's the, the jury is still very much out on that. But the hard problem of consciousness is that of explaining how all this complex interaction in the brain should give rise to a subjectively experienced inner life. The uh, internal sensation of vision, colors, and shapes, feeling, sounds, emotions, thoughts. And right now I think there's no, no one has a good solution to the hard problem. It seems to me that the quantum mechanical solutions are subject to exactly the same gap in this case as the classical ones are. So we're as far away as we ever were then. The science is progressing. And the way to think about it, I think, is like this. Uh, we, we don't have a solution to the, to the problem of consciousness, but science is giving us data and it's giving us constraints on a theory. Right now, in the form of correlations, this kind of physical process goes along with this kind of subjective experience. Now, I expect things are going to move ahead like that for the next 20 or 30 years, giving us a more and more detailed science of the correlations between brain processes and consciousness. But somewhere down the line, I think, all that, all that gathering of data is going to give us pretty strong constraints on the form of a final theory of consciousness. Through looking at the, at the principles we discover there, it won't wear a metaphysical theory of consciousness on its sleeve, but it may end up guiding us in the right direction. 
So maybe 50 years down the track, that's, a, that's the time which I think uh, there's a prospect for some kind of progress on this problem. Just finding the correlations and the connections here doesn't itself give us a solution. I think that you know, a solution to the problem of consciousness is probably going to take at least three really big ideas. You know, no more than one of which has anyone, uh, has anyone had yet. And just as with the case of explaining life, explaining the physics of the universe, there are a couple of pretty big conceptual revolutions that came along every time. My own sense is that's going to happen. That's going to have to happen at least a couple of times in unexpected ways before we really understand consciousness. The people who are thinking about this the most and the hardest are actually, and the most rigorously, are quite often doing it within the academic discipline. So it wouldn't at all surprise me if some radical philosopher or a very creative neuroscientist comes along just as creative molecular biologists help solve the problem of understanding the genetics. So the purpose of conferences like the Tucson Conference on Consciousness is to bring together people from all these fields to see if they can collectively combine their insights in ways that recombine and lead to creative new directions. I think a lot of the people who come to conferences on consciousness aren't ultimately doing it for the applications. They're doing it for the understanding, sure, to understand themselves. But it is a side effect of a lot of this that all kinds of interesting applications come out of it. Uh, we saw a few talks by people developing devices to enable blind people to see by uh, having the, the image fed to, fed to their ears, converted into sound, fed to their ears. Fascinating. Um, once we understand the neural correlates of consciousness, that may well be able to give us some kind of guide to all kinds of questions we can't now understand about what's going on in the consciousness of people under anesthesia, mm -hmm. or people in comas, for example. Maybe are they locked in, simply unable to move, or um, unconscious, or are they completely unconscious? Right now, it's very difficult to tell, but the more we understand about neural processes underlying consciousness, the more there's the prospect that sometime we might be able to look at that person's brain and get some sense of what's going on. Ultimately, it might even be possible to develop some line of communication, that way, although that's probably some distance in the future. Line of communication, sort of uh, subliminal then, you're saying? Just say we've got a patient uh, who's in coma, uh, completely locked in, completely paralyzed. But it might well turn out, for all we know, that uh, those people are actually conscious. There are people who have locked in syndrome where they can just, for example, move one eyelid. There was a guy who wrote a whole book by blinking his eyelid just the right number of times for every letter of the alphabet while he was paralyzed. He was paralyzed, he had control over exactly one muscle. Hmm. His left eyelid, uh, he wrote a book on this, it was called The Diving Bell on the Butterfly. And he dictated it by one blink for an A, two blinks for a B, and so on. For every letter, he wrote a whole book, and thus he managed to communicate. But now imagine somebody just like him, but without the eyelid. Mm -hmm. They're locked in, they're paralyzed. As far as we can tell from the outside, they might be in a coma. They might not even be conscious. Once we understand the neural correlates of consciousness, that may be our only way to, uh, to tell by some kind of indirect means. We'll look at what's going on in their brain, and we'll infer from that. They have the signature of consciousness. And then we'll know whether they're conscious or not. Maybe even somewhere down the line. Not just they have the signature of consciousness, but they have the, signature, they have the brain signature of this very thought. They have the brain signature of that very thought. And we might then be able to interpret their thoughts, and carry on some kind of communication. I actually think that Eastern traditions have something to contribute here. Not so, they, the Eastern traditions built up grand metaphysics of the world and its structure and so on, which are quite creative and quite foreign to you know, the Western eye. I don't think we necessarily need to accept their metaphysics in order to, get, to find some kind of value uh, from their methods. What the Eastern traditions also have done is built up methodologies, careful, detailed methodologies for studying consciousness from the inside through contemplation, through introspection, through careful studying and cataloging of the contents and the different levels of one's own consciousness. That's something which right now in Western science is at a very primitive level. We have data about brains and behavior from the third person point of view, studied very carefully. But we all of us have data from the inside too, about our own consciousness. The people do appeal to this in Western science. I'm seeing red now, I'm feeling pain now, and so on. It would be nice to have methods for studying consciousness, for gathering the data about consciousness from the first person point of view that are as well developed as our methods for gathering data about the brain from the third person point of view. And here is where I think that those, uh, those Eastern traditions and also other phenomenological traditions in the West and elsewhere have quite a lot to contribute. A lot of what they're saying, a lot of what's in part of this tradition, some of it may turn out, turn out to be worthless, some of it may turn out to be completely worthwhile, so I don't think we should approach it 
uncritically, but the methods could be useful. And once again, once we understand, for example, the states of consciousness that are being catalogued, we can then study the neural correlates and get a, a richer understanding of the relationship between variations in states of the brain and variations in states of consciousness.